Okay. Excellent. So welcome everybody to the first online version of the Dynamo Users Island group. Um, I hope these are difficult times and I hope everyone's keeping safe and, uh, and well. Um, we are um, very pleased that we can host this and I want to thank John Bennett for setting up and hosting the, the Zoom call. And, um, and I want to thank Dieter Vermeulen and Jalal Saman for their time this morning to, to give us some presentations on, on Dynamo and generative design, et cetera. Um, just a quick reminder to everybody to, to join the discussion uh, on, on the use of Dynamo on our LinkedIn group or Twitter group or meetup group. And uh, hopefully we can have, have some more of these, these sessions um, over this period. So I think with that, John, I'll, I'll hand it back to you. Fantastic, Ralph. Thank you very much. And just one very quick um, element that I'd like to share with everyone. I think, Ralph, you, you reminded me of this this morning. We have a, you know, a COVID-19 resource centre that's available to everyone. And I might just paste that in the chat as we get started. It's, um, it allows every audit users around the world to take advantage of some of our cloud technology free of charge between now and May 31st. So if you need to work from home or you're a remote worker, you know, we will give you access to some of our te technology to enable that to happen more effective and more efficiently. So Dieter, if you're okay, I'm gonna stop sharing and maybe you can share your screen. Sure. Here we go. So uh, yes, good morning, all of you, and uh, thanks for having me on this uh, uh, on this exceptional uh, user group meeting. Um, now um, I'm going to talk to you about generative design in the next 25 minutes, and uh, especially about uh, what has been launched last week in our global launch of our uh, new uh, fiscal year products, so the 2021 versions. Now, but before we kick off. Uh, on, on generative design specifically, I want to give you a little bit of insight on how we look um, at this whole design methodology from an Autodesk point of view. So designs today, actually they didn't change that much if you compare it with um, what we did 60 years ago. We are still delivering buildings um, in a traditional way by recording it on paper. And we deliver it to others who then execute it and who make sure that the buildings and the constructions are being built, of course. Now, and the expertise 60 years ago or even further, the expertise is inside of our heads. It's inside of these people's heads. Now with software, we try to capture what is inside of that head. So imagine that we can combine or engineering or designer or architectural expertise, just construction, building expertise, whatever you want to call it. If you want to combine this with algorithmic intelligence from computers, then we can produce better buildings. Because in a traditional design process, um, before we started using computers even to help automate things, designing was kind of a game of a battleship. So you blindly guess on a spot and if you're doing any kind of simulation or analysis, you can wait for a hit or a miss and then you come back. By the time you get a hit, you're willing to settle the acceptable solution instead of leveraging a larger design space and getting closer to the optimal solution. Now with generative design, we are working in a more streamlined process. There is humans that are defining the concept, defining the constraints and what are the goals of what we would like to achieve. And we use a computer to generate multiple solutions, evolve them towards an optimal solution, and then use algorithms to find that optimal solution. Now, it's again people, it's again humans that are evaluating the results and that are refining uh, all the specific design solutions you get to select the proper solution for that purpose. So generative design is not really an automation tool that is going to take away our jobs. No, it's actually going to create more jobs because 
you will need more people to understand how to build up the whole design technology around it. And secondly, generative design, it is a methodology, it is a process. Uh, it's not just a tool, it's not just like a few buttons you get inside of Revit, for instance, uh, and you can click on it to get like your specific solutions. No, think about this as a methodology, think about it as a process. It's a mindset. Now, there are some business values on it, of course, as well. Um, that's the, uh, the whole goal, of course, of having uh, new tools, new methodologies in our design technology. Now, within the architectural business, we face a lot of external challenges. There are, the, the projects are becoming more complex, and this has an impact on our profitability. Now, because of these complex projects, we also face <clears throat> challenges and inefficiencies during our process. Now, the impact of that is that we have a lot of manual processes to do. Uh, there's a lot of data handoffs, change management that is really difficult to deal with. Now, decision-making as a third one is often difficult for that complexity of systems and also for the lack of data from past or similar experiences. And the impact of that is that we have these complex systems with lots of varied project goals. And there are also like unrealistic delivery expectations sometimes leading to new project delivery methods and structures. And it also may enhance, uh, make, en make risk more enhanced. Now within the building industry, uh, there is a lot of trends as well. Um, well, this is a very, uh, very current one now, the diverse project teams and working from uh, distance, uh, not working from home and then trying to collaborate with each other from this from dispersed spaces. There is also a trend on uh, design technologies that are emerging. There's computational and generative design tools that are automating the most mundane design and documentation tasks, and they, they help us a lot to increase in creative efforts. Efficiency, sustainability is also a, a, a specific trend, and um, this comes up every time in like, uh, yeah, in, in, in these generative design uh, workflows that you will see. And of course, there are changes, changes in the roles and responsibilities uh, within a company. Now, the business opportunities for an architect, uh, and this is almost the last slide on, this, on the theory around this, the business opportunities for architects is mainly the negotiation part. Um, by using automation tools, by using generative design tools, we make it possible to negotiate with our customers, as an architect at least, not as Autodesk, but as an architect. It makes us more flexible in approaching uh, different contracts. Like for instance, people, if you want to have a project that is delivered way faster, you want this kind of VIP treatment, well, it will cost you more. You will get it faster, but it will cost you more, and you will have the tools to make that possible. Um, of course, besides that, there is the efficiency. So if you have like fixed fee projects and you need to, uh, there, there is like a lot of manual work, very time consuming work that could be automated, then generative design and design automation are very, uh, uh, efficient tools for that. And besides that, the value adding is something we cannot ignore because generative design gives us completely different uh, solutions on specific problems that we normally would not find if we are looking at it from a manual perspective uh, or just a iterative design process that we are traditionally doing, the game of battleship. And there are a lot of workflow benefits and business benefits with generative design. I'm not going to read all the text. I suppose all of you can see this. Um, and it helps us to mainly save time, do more iterations. And there is like, for instance, a very interesting part, reduction of waste and having the possibility to make early design decisions. And this helps us to um, this helps us to increase a customer satisfaction. Uh, it helps you as, as, as a user to reduce the project lifecycle costs 
and uh, attract top talent, for instance, in the company because you are using way more enhanced, way more sophisticated software. Now, the design technology progression we went through or we are going through to get into generative design looks like this. We used to start with computer-aided drafting after we stopped using manual uh, ways such as pen and paper. So with AutoCAD, we could automate already the way how designs, the way how drawings at least were delivered. And that's what we call traditional design. We are recording a decision. So we are capturing what is inside of our head. We have an ID and you capture it. It's like designing a chair. If I ask you, design a chair for me, start to draw a chair, then probably you already have within 10 seconds an image inside of your head and you're going to draw what is inside of that. So we are progressing more into parametric design. That's where we associate geometry with it. And parametric modeling with Revit is one of it. That chair could be, for instance, a more parametric model. The topology is inside of your head and you're using tools to make this flexible and to make it possible to use parameters to have like a different type of chair. In design automation, we are going to use tools to automate the way how things are designed. For instance, if you want to use that same chair and you want to position it uh, inside of a room layout, you use design automation to automatically place these kinds of things. And computational model goes a, a, a little piece further. Computational modeling, it will also analyze what is actually inside of your design. Is this design a good one? Because I'm using all kinds of parameters and these parameters have an effect on, on how the design looks like. You have a visual result of it, but is it a good design? And that's where computational modeling comes in. It helps you to make relationships by using visual scripting tools such as Dynamo, and at the same time use analysis, um, not really analysis tools, but just analysis perspectives. Uh, for instance, what is the area of a surface? That's an analysis. Count the number of elements. That's an analysis. That's very basic, but it could go very complex as well. And all of these techniques, these three techniques, they are uh, what we call parametric design. And um, it's still recording a decision. It's still capturing what we have inside of our head but you can associate geometry with it from very basic to very complex topologies. And that's where Revit and Dynamo comes in. Now, at a certain moment, you can see that this blue is gradiently going into green. And that's the part where we are changing our mindset into from starting uh, thinking like, let's design a chair towards the green part where we say like, let's design something to sit on. And then the result could generally be everything. It could be a bench, it could be a couch, it could be one of those um, uh, design uh, sitting cubes, it could be a wheelchair, it could be anything. As long as you can sit on it, as long as it can reach the goals that you want. For instance, it needs to have a specific height, it needs to be able to support a specific weight. So that's your goals that you're describing and your constraints are then, for instance, it needs to be as economic as possible, it needs to stand on the ground, of course, and all these kinds of things. So you're com you look at it from a completely different perspective. You're questioning yourself on how does that design need to, uh, what value does my design need to have? How should it look like? And how should it behave? And that's where generative design in Revit comes into picture. Now, the generative design process is this, uh, can be documented in this way. You start generating data, not really generating, it's maybe uh, setting up your data because you have some variables, you have some constraints that you are already knowing before you start thinking about the problem. And then you start generating a geometry from it. You start generating what we call a computational model. And this model gets analyzed. Like for instance, what is the surface? What is the number of elements I can see uh, in my immediate view angle, for instance? Uh, how far do I need to walk from that, that point to that point? These, all these kinds of things are called analysis. So you get metrics from it. Everything which, which can, uh, what can be approached by mathematics is analysis. 
we rank it by giving it a score, then evolve this and explore it as a human again. So we use our human expertise to explore the results and then to integrate it into our BIM model. Now this is the process if we look at it from a very simplistic point of view. This is the stage here when design options are created or they are generated by the system using algorithms. I have a question. Yeah, well, uh, at the end of the, of the presentation, we will have uh, some time for questions. So um, what is generated by the system here is using algorithms and parameters specified by a designer. The analyze part is the where the designs are generated or where the designs that were generated in the previous steps are now measured. They are analyzed on how well they achieve goals that are defined by the designer. And ranking is based on the results of the analysis. The design options are ordered or ranked. Now the process will use the ranking of the design options to figure out in which direction the design should be further developed or evolved. And that's what, where the algorithms come in to use, uh, in this case, genetic algorithms to evolve to a similar solution, which is being seen as an optimal one. Now, finally, the generated designs are compared or explored by the designer and they ins inspecting both the geometry and the evaluation results, because it's not just the results, it's also the aesthetic part and maybe what is constructible. Now, once you have your final solution, you can integrate it and the designer is using uh, this, this, this specific result into the wider project or the design work. Now, what is it? Well, let's Introducing have a little new view generative on design capabilities now available in Revit 2021 with the AEC collection. With Revit's generative design capabilities, you can rapidly generate design alternatives based on your goals, constraints, and inputs. Then explore, optimize, and make informed decisions with your team. You'll get started with ready-made studies that you can use to explore and generate design alternatives based on your desired outcomes. Specify your goals, then leverage the power of generative design to create multiple design options. You and your team can explore and evaluate those options against your goals. And if you didn't get it quite right the first time, you can quickly iterate by running the generative design process again, tweaking the inputs and goals to find the best solution possible. These ready-made studies are starting points. You can completely customize these studies and add new ones through Dynamo to help meet your own studio and office-specific standards and challenges. For example, maybe your client wants to expand their building with a new wing. You need to optimize rentable space while minimizing cost. Generative design can help find the best outcome. Then you can take your design right into Revit for further development. Or maybe you're designing a new office and need to maximize the number of desks but minimize the distance to exits. Generative design can help you quickly create options based on your most important metrics, like desk count and aisle width, so you can find the most desirable solution. And if your client wants tenants to have great window views from inside the office, generative design can help identify the best spot to place furniture. You'll generate viewpoints in various locations, then use the graph to rank designs based on what matters to you most. These studies are completely customizable and new studies can be added via Dynamo so you can create and discuss design options with your team. With generative design in Revit, you have the power to bring outcome-based decision-making to your design studies. Start using generative design with the AEC collection today. Not sure if the audio came in very well on your side, uh, but anyway, this gave you like an overview of what we have launched last week uh, in the global launch of our 2021 products. Now, generative design in Revit um, <clears throat> is something uh, interesting for you to know. Uh, is that if you have a Revit standalone, then generative design in Revit will not work from within Revit because within Revit itself, you have like this, you will have new. Uh, two new buttons in manage uh, in the manage tab on your ribbon. Now these are not accessible if you have a Revit standalone. If the Revit is coming from your collections or if you have an enterprise um, license, then you will be able to access it from within Revit. 
Although generative design is still accessible from within Dynamo, the only thing you will not have is having the possibility to select your Revit content, your Revit, um, your Revit environment, and you will not be able to create Revit elements from that generative design uh, interface. Now, um, what is also possible is that from within Dynamo, there is, you have the export to generate, you have the possibility to export the generative designs from Dynamo to Revit uh, in Revit itself. You will have like specific buttons for it after you've done your previous selection. And I was a little bit distracted by um, some weird uh, guy that, <laughs> that came in here into the, uh, into the chat box. So I've removed that person. Sorry for that, uh, for that event. Now, how do we do this? I have a few, a few examples. I have three examples to explain you how generative design in Revit is working. And you will get this presentation uh, available afterwards as well. Now, the first part here is um, where I want to show you how we, for instance, could do a layout of desks inside of a room in here. Now, it's a very, these, these work, this workspace layout example and all the others, they are, I mean, they are also available within the sample uh, files that you will get after you've installed Revit 2021. So you will have these available immediately from within Revit as an access. So this helps you to understand how these types of scripts are being built. Now, um, the, the way that we can do it in here is creating a specific layout that evaluates the size of the room and it evaluates the way how we can position all of these little desks and then add some analysis to it. An analysis part could be, what is it the view to outside? If you want to have like a comfortable feeling, you want to have a desk where you can sit along and where you have the best view to the windows outside. And then you, you, you might get like less conventional results from it um, to, uh, to come to like your specific results. But this is what generative design is doing. It's really ba basing itself on the way how you make your own analysis. That's a very important thing to understand. The way how you create the analysis is the way how generative design will respond on it. The second example is a lighting study. Uh, and uh, in the second presentation, I'm, I'm pretty sure you will see uh, a way and way more enhanced example as the one as I'm here showing in here. But this is purely to give you an idea on how the concept is working of generative design in Revit. So in here we can select the Revit context, and the Revit context is the room. And with that Revit context, we are going to place a few light bulbs and then evaluate what is actually the effect, the mathematical effect of each of these light bulbs on the floor. Now, it's not using daylight analysis tools. It's purely using a conceptual mathematical formula uh, that is approaching the way how light rays are distributed in a, in, uh, in a room. And then a final example is the mass study layout. Within this one, uh, we can evaluate how, for instance, the volume of a building, how it will have an effect internally and also into the environment. Now, this is not um, cropping the way uh, or the creativity of an architect. No, this is just generating the volume, the possible volume in which an architect can design his building and to respect like a specific result you want to have to respect the goals that you want to have in here to come to like an optimal uh, building. Now there is a way, lots of ways to uh, evaluate these things and to generate all of these uh, possible scripts but I would recommend you to dive into the examples and to look how this Dynamo script has been built up to learn how the, the process has been set up from data, generate, analyze, evolve, uh, explore, and integrate. So what is next? Uh, within Revit 2021, if you take the Revit help, you will find lots of documentation in there that explains you on how generative design is approached, what is generative design, 
uh, what are the things you need to uh, focus on to, for instance, understand what is an input, what is a goal, what is an output, and how does it respond into those two new interfaces that came in with uh, Revit. And of course, there's also the generative design primer. So that, that's a very good um, web page that has been built up. Uh, it used, it, we used to call it refinery primer, and uh, now it has changed, of course, a little bit. And this will uh, give you lots of sample workflows additionally on top of the example files that you already have in Revit 21. This is also an overview of uh, Dynamo packages that might be interesting uh, to use. These are all packages that have been developed by Autodesk people, so it's maintained by Autodesk. So uh, you're sure that uh, we are, um, uh, or we can guarantee at least that we are maintaining uh, these, uh, these packages to make sure that it keeps working uh, for the newer versions of uh, Dynamo. So, uh, thanks for your attention on this. And um, I'm not sure if you still have time to do like some little Q&A because there was uh, a question from someone, I think, except for if it was the scammer on this uh, meeting. Yeah, we have a few minutes to um, to have some questions. So if anybody has some questions, just unmute your mic and uh, fire away. I might start, Dieter. Um, is there a possibility with generative design that you create too many options <laughs> and too much work for yourself mm -hmm. in evaluating? Yeah. That's, that's a really good point. That's the, um, <clears throat> uh, that might be the downsides of using these tools, is that you get like an overflow of uh, results. And what I would do uh, is make sure that if you generate um, design options, don't focus on having a huge bunch of design options. That's not the goal of generative design. You need to have a good amount of design options to make sure that your evaluation is done properly. Because if you have to choose from three results, then how can you say that these three results are the best one? Because result number four or five might be a better one. Now, within, generative, within the explore results part of generative design and Revit, we give lots of possibilities to filter uh, on four results. So it means that you can have four, at least four goals into your results and use them uh, to filter out the best solution. So for instance, uh, this is that where in these videos, you could see that diagram with an X axis and a Y axis, but all the dots that were placed in the, in the graph uh, are then colored and you also have like a specific size uh, of that dot. And this is helping the people to understand, ah, okay, uh, if I take a solution which is very close to this X value or this Y value, then the other two values, the other two goals, uh, might have a less uh, positive impact. And then I see in the chat box a question, uh, if the lighting automation works with IES files, no, it's not using these. It's purely using a very conceptual mathematical formula uh, where you can input the influence of the light intensity and the influence of uh, power. Um, so this is not even the results that come out of it are not even not even looks values. They are purely what we call influence values. So power and intensity is influencing the way how uh, how the light is concentrated inside of your room, and this is just to see what would be the influence. And it might help you to uh, decide how many of these light bulbs you need to have inside on, onto your ceiling and how they need to be distributed. And this way, with that result, you can do more specific, detailed uh, light analysis with proper tools that are meant for that. Any other questions? Okay. That's great, Dieter. I really appreciate that and, and your time. And uh, that was a fantastic introduction to what's coming in Revit 2021 with generative design. So, Sure. Thanks. That's great. Okay. Um, so next up, we have Jalal Saman from Mott McDonald's. Uh, Jalal, Morning. Um, do you have control of whatever you need to do? <laughs> Morning. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. 
thank you for having me here. I'm going to share my screen. Uh, I think uh, Dieter needs to stop sharing first. Okay. Okay. That's great. So, um, good morning, everyone. To those of you who don't know me, uh, my name is Jalal Seaman. I'm a principal technology consultant at Mott McDonald. And uh, today I'll be presenting to you some uh, workflow on uh, daylighting, which I have uh, created a publication for during my master's dissertation around three years ago, where I have used uh, Revit and Dynamo. Uh, in this workflow. So uh, the target for today is to set up a Revit environment with a SunPath diagram uh, to build a, a SunPath attractor system in Dynamo, in Dynamo to enable the uh, SunPath analysis and uh, to maximize the glazing area to allow abundance of ambient daylighting. And I'll be showing you uh, some examples of way forward in this workflow. So. Uh, I've, I've added a link here at the bottom of the screen on the right bottom for the data sets of this uh, presentation. So to start with some inspirations here, and uh, this is from, this is the Kiefer Technik showroom in uh, Austria, where it's a uh, sustainable building. And using Dynamo, I have managed to uh, replicate the system. Uh, and this is the example down here, and I've added a full tutorial on this on my blog if you want to uh, download it I'm not going to go through the whole video but this is just again where uh, these ideas started to come from and uh, this is another example of Al Bahar Towers in uh, Abu Dhabi uh, this was really based on the uh, paper which I have or actually my paper was based on this example here the paper I published in advanced building skin in Switzerland uh, again, around uh, two years ago, where I have maximized the daylight using uh, Dynamo and some other plugins and software and packages. I have managed to maximize the daylight uh, uh, in an example building, achieving around 88% useful daylight illuminance with it. Uh, so next slide. This is the graph that I will be demonstrating for today. And in this example, I will be showing you uh, the adaptive component, which I have created. This adaptive component was uh, mapped over a divided surface. And then I used Dynamo and uh, the Sun Attractor system in Revit to create variations for the openings of these um, uh, windows or uh, the openings of the facade. The idea here is that uh, the panels that are facing the sun would be closed and the panels on the other sides on other orientations uh, in a typical building would be open to allow uh, ambient uh, or useful daylight in. Meanwhile, uh, the panels that are facing the sun will shut in order to uh, reduce the heat gain on the building. And the way this graph works is that it picks up the sun settings from uh, Revit and then uh, you can acquire the, the family uh, adaptive component family which I have used and uh, start to uh, read some data and info from this family such as uh, points and then vary these points to uh, to uh, another point which is representing the sun here uh, up on the right screen and as you can see there are many lines like a cone and these lines are really uh, you can consider them as uh, vectors coming in from the sun and then they're measured and based on the measurement of each line uh, the, the panels will start to open and close, and I can automate this as well as I will show you in a minute. Okay, I've added in this presentation, um, something's wrong with the slide, okay. I've added in the presentation here just a quick demo as to how to get the uh, Sun Attractor and Revit for those of uh, you who uh, are doing this for the first time. And uh, I'll just go into the demo right now. Okay, so this is uh, my Dynamo scene. This is the Revit scene. I have created a file here. And inside this file... Sorry, Jadal, yes. um, your, your screen isn't displaying. Okay, I'll try again. Oh. 
Is that better? Yeah, thank you. So I'm in Revit here, and this is the building that I have created. These are the uh, panels that are uh, being uh, placed on the divided surface. I will uh, open quickly one of these panels just to show you the adaptive component. I'll keep this here in the, in the background. So eventually this is the adaptive component that I've used and I've mapped it over a divided surface. Now, um, I got the sun attractor inside Revit simply by uh, going to the family mass here, changing this to 3D view and then clicking on sun path. Once you click on sun path, the sun path appears. You can go to the graphics display options. When you open it, go to lighting, inside lighting in session, and then you get the actual weather data here. So if you have Dublin, uh, 21 June, 2020 at the time, you can click here and you can have the actual weather data integrated along with it. So I'm gonna close this just for the time being. Okay. Now inside, inside Dynamo, how I, how I started the script, I pulled out the sun settings node and I ran the script. And the, as you can see, the sun settings were pulled into Dynamo connected it to the uh, sun settings direction, direction to get the vector of the sun, and then connected the vector to uh, create a point from it inside uh, Dynamo. So when I run this, just one second, I want to minimize this uh, screen here on the right. So when I run this and I go to the uh, background inside Dynamo, uh, I should be able to see uh, the sun the, the point of the uh, representing the, uh, the sun. So I'm just going to turn. This is the point representing the sun. And now I want to start uh, acquiring the uh, adaptive components from Revit. So to get this, I pull the family uh, types uh, node. Here you can select which family type you're using inside the project. This is the family type that I'm using. And I want to bring in all the instances of this family type. So once you connect it to all elements of type, you can get here, I have 104 panels in the example which I've showed you above it. Now connect this to adaptive component locations and you can get all the points or the locations of these uh, uh, panels that are inside the project. In order to visualize this better, I will connect it to a polygon by points and run it. And this is a representation of what we have here in uh, Revit. Okay. So what I want to now do now is uh, I want the centroid of each and every panel in order to start creating this, uh, this variation or this relationship with the sun. So I'll connect this to a, a polygon uh, center node and try to uh, bring out a line from the sun. As you can see, now I've created vectors coming from the sun on each and every panel. So the, the dimension or the line, the length of each and every uh, line coming in from the sun will be used to vary the uh, panels and the outcome of this example. So here, I need to get the lengths and to get the lengths, I will use a uh, distance to, but I'm just gonna unpeel you this for the time being. There you go. Okay. And I pulled in the geometry distance to node, and now I will connect the uh, points that I have from the uh, centroid of the panels to uh, the sun and run. And now I have a series of uh, uh, lengths that I will use to vary the, uh, the opening of the panels. To do this uh, better also, I've used a map remap range to represent the shutter opener of the of the panel. I'm going to go to Revit. Please tell me if uh, you cannot see my screen. Let's see. Can you still see my screen? We're still looking at Dynamo. Or... I have to stop sharing again. It seems that I cannot switch uh, the view, so I have to stop and go back into uh, yeah, Revit. No Is that better now? Okay. So. Here, this is the adaptive component panel. And I'll just click on one of these points here. And as you can see, there's a normalized curve parameter attached to it. So this parameter will control the opening and the closing of the panel. If I go to my family types, and here, if I change, if I change the opening ratio here 
the shutter to say 0.35 and I apply, the panel will completely close. If I change it to say 0.9, the panel will completely open. So to create this variation or to replicate this variation uh, quickly for several panels inside Dynamo, uh, I'm gonna have to go back into Dynamo here, so I'll stop sharing. Okay, so inside Dynamo, this is the representation of the uh, shutter opening and closing. So I'm creating a parameter uh, for each and every panel from these lengths. And now to make this change happen inside uh, Revit, I will pull out the element set parameter node and bring in the uh, elements into it, which are the panels the name of the parameter which I have just showed you inside uh, Revit and the values which have been created here to open and shut each and every uh, panel. And I'll put the element geometry to bring these into Dynamo and click. It's gonna take a uh, less than a minute, hopefully. Okay, as you can see here in the uh, background, let me just turn off this. Preview. These are the, uh, the panels. The panels that are facing the sun are closed and the panels that are uh, to the other side are open. I'm gonna have to switch back to Revit here and unfortunately I have to stop sharing again. Are you seeing the Revit screen, Ralph? Please tell me. Not yet, we're still seeing the dynamo. I believe now you should be able to see it. Yeah, that's great. This is very tricky on Zoom. <laughs> uh, so in, in dynamo, uh, once you uh, finish, just change the execution to automatic. And then here, um, as you can see, the panels that are facing the sun are closed. On the other side, the panels are open. And just to make this clearer, I'm just gonna turn off the uh, mass here. We've gone back to your dynamo screen. Oh, <laughs> uh, share desktop, you said? I'm not sure, uh, I'm not sure how to do that, but anyway, you can see my Revit screen now. Okay, good. So uh, now inside, uh, inside Revit, I'm just gonna change the time here on the sun and you'll see how this will change automatically. So I'm gonna change this say to uh, 12 o'clock. And as you see, Revit is calculating now. The panels on the side of the sun are closed and on the other side they are open. Okay, and, and you can start creating now several time periods inside inside Revit and exporting these from Dynamo to Excel to use say an uh, daylight analysis software. I'll change this one more time say to uh, 10 o'clock in the morning. And because Dynamo in the background is set to automatic, it is uh, making these calculations automatically. So again, panels facing the sun are closed and on the other side are open. We can start pulling out the areas 
of, uh, of uh, these uh, panels. I'm going to go back to my uh, presentation. Can you see my presentation now? Yes. Yeah. Okay, good. So that one. And then in, in one of these workflows, I pulled out the, uh, uh, the actual panel settings and the, uh, the model from the time analysis period, which I've created in Revit, into Dynamo again. And I used Ladybug to create this uh, uh, grid testing, grid for testing. And then I used Honeybee to get the Lux out of, uh, out of these. And this is, a, again, I've added these uh, scripts and the data sets, which I provided for this presentation. And here, uh, again, I took the same system into uh, a refinery for generative design. And on the right, you can see uh, the variation of the glazing from uh, several uh, random kind of uh, opening uh, values, opening parameters, which I provided in, uh, in Dynamo. So it created several options for me to maximize the, uh, the glazing area. What, what I also did with this workflow is not only uh, I created, okay, the optimal, or I found my optimal uh, glazing uh, areas, I also took it to design for manufacturing and assembly where I'm still working to finalize this in order to unfold these parts. And uh, in this example here, no Python scripts were used, so it was simply just out of the box, took, took the final uh, outcome of these panels, spread them over, and all I have to do is just unfold them and probably send them to uh, CNC machine. And uh, that's it, really. Questions? It was very interesting, Jalal. It was excellent. Um, all the, all the data sets for these uh, will be provided. I will put them in the. Uh, yeah. uh, would you mind Would you mind posting the link? Um, yeah, sure. In the chat, just that uh, you know, that people. Would... I sent you uh, uh, the link, uh, uh, Ralph, because I'm not able to send it to everyone for some reason. So if you can just share it, please. Yeah. Okay. To, to do kinetic facades manually is impossible. Impossible. Uh, if you look at the example of the Al-Bahar Towers, which I showed you in my, I think, third slide, uh, this was done by Arup, and they had to do Java scripting uh, in order to, uh, to, to model these and uh, find the opening size and the shutter opening on different, depending on different analysis periods. Um, with, with the uh, example that I've shown here, using simple conventional software using Revit and, uh, and Dynamo, I was able to uh, just set the time period inside Revit, and it was extremely accurate because when I took it uh, uh, to my to, to be published in Advanced Building Skins in Switzerland, in Switzerland uh, it was peer-reviewed, first of all, and uh, we have realized that the sun path diagram inside Revit uh, is giving us extreme, uh, extremely accurate results, uh, regardless of whether we're seeing the lux or not. So. Just by uh, setting the sun, I'm at the, the, the area where the panels have been shut and open uh, was very close to being extremely accurate. So when I took it to uh, daylighting software such as Ladybug or, uh, I don't know, uh, Radiant software, uh, the results were, were fairly straightforward. And of course, because I can extract this information uh, straight into Excel, we even took it further into uh, heating and cooling load calculations. Uh, we realized that if you use Energy Plus, for instance, uh, Energy Plus reads a, a word or a text template file. And by using Dynamo, I have managed to extract uh, 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 text files to fill in that template. Uh, and then all the information went into Energy Plus straight away for, for calculation. Although I have not used Energy Plus in my, uh, in my publication, but at a later stage, we have used Energy Plus to do also the heating and cooling loads of the same examples, uh, similar example, which I have showed you there. 
it may be it may seem a little bit uh, complicated uh, maybe uh, just to see if they're happening but it was extremely simple so after you create the adaptive component uh, uh, family and you load it into Revit get take the simulations out uh, uh, as as uh, as uh, analysis periods or time analysis periods and extract the information into an excel sheet and use it as you wish and to do this manually by hand it's impossible that's great any other questions i think those are two excellent presentations and um we john you've recorded those so we we can make those available through the Dynamo LinkedIn group or Twitter group, if, if, if unless anyone has any objection to that. Um, and yeah, I think we've definitely entered a new era of uh, <laughs> meetings and online meetings, and um, it's opening up opportunities, I think, for people to meet in easier ways and from different locations. So, um, but, yeah. Absolutely. Oh, you mean you, you're not eating pizza and drinking beer at the moment? Oh, I thought it was. I thought I thought it was mandatory. <laughs> anyway, so thank you, Dieter, and thank you, Joel, for your time. I really appreciate that, and um, I think that that was excellent. Um, any, I don't know if there's any further questions in the chat. <laughs> the pizza comes out of the USB slot. Thanks, Pierre. <laughs> yeah. Well, if Yeah, yeah. And if anybody wants to present, uh, please contact me, and uh, we'll, we can make it happen. Very good. So I hope everybody um, keeps safe and uh, keeps well. And uh, I think we can probably close the meeting. This. Anybody has some <laughs> last words? Thanks. Thanks, everyone. Have a good day. Bye-bye.